So we're going to be looking at the Bohr model, and I'm just going to be talking about uh, lines and colors we see for the hydrogen atom, so one particular um, atom. We're going to start talking about the Lyman series. After I do a little bit of labeling onto the Bohr model. So the black dot in the middle is the nucleus, and we're not going to be talking about the protons and neutrons. That's not going to affect any of our energy levels. Each of the dotted rings is a energy level. So we have the first energy level. We're thinking of it a little bit differently than maybe you first saw Bohr before you just thought of it thought of it as a planetary model, now you're realizing there's actually a wave going around that average distance around the nucleus. You cannot have an electron or a wave overlap in between the first and the second. It would kill itself, it would destructively interfere, you wouldn't have a nice standing wave in between one and two. So an electron can exist in the first energy level, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and I've only shown six, but there's an infinite amount of energy levels. Okay. To ionize something, you would take the electron and you drive it infinitely far away. Okay. Okay. Now, the Lyman series is a series of transitions when an electron gets excited. So an electron would start off at the first energy level. That's referred to as the ground state for hydrogen. Hydrogen is one electron. It's going to be in the energy level that's the closest to the nucleus. But if you heat it up, okay, you put hydrogen in a lamp and you apply voltage, electrical power to it, you can drive that electron to a higher energy level. The Lyman series is when electrons fall back down to that first energy level. So the N final, and I'm using N for the energy level, and I'll use N in the next lesson as the principal quantum number. Okay? When the N final is 1, that would be a member of the Lyman series. So from going up to 2 and then falling back to 1, 3 falling back to 1 would be Lyman, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, or the last one I can draw is 6 to 1. All of those are Lyman. And these are all ultraviolet wavelengths. So the human eye can't see them. And we wouldn't want to be exposed to ultraviolet radiation. Luckily, glass blocks UV radiation. So we will do a lab. We're going to study the next series, and we don't have to worry about this ultraviolet radiation because the glass blocks it. When you drive in a car, you don't get sunburnt in a car. Why not? It's the glass that protects you. When you're in a house, you don't get sunburnt. Okay? But if you drive in an automobile and the window is down and your arm is hanging out, then you can't get a sunburn without that glass to protect you. The next series is the Bombers series. This series requires the electron in the ground state, the first energy level, to get excited. You have to put energy in, drive the electron to a higher energy level, and then it falls back down to the second level. And F, the N final, or the energy level final, or the principal quantum number final being two. So the first transition you'd get down to two is three to two. And we're going to see shortly, when you go three to two, you get a wavelength that corresponds to red, 700 and some nanometers. When you fall four down to two, it, your eye perceives that as green. It's a different wavelength. 
five to two is a blue color, a wavelength that corresponds to blue. And six to two is a violet or purple color. So the bomber series is in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm going to talk about a couple more series, but where, where we're going with this is tying in that first uh, lesson on leading into quantum mechanics. If we know the energy of four and we know the energy of two, we can calculate the energy of that green wavelength. So if we know four, we know two, we know the energy, and the energy is H nu. So all we have to do is know the energy of where the electron started, the energy where it finished, we can know the difference, Planck's constant, we look up and we can get the frequency. And we can turn that to wavelength if we want. C is lambda nu. Okay. So we know the energy, we know the frequency. If we know the frequency, we could get the wavelength. I could ask, or you could be asked to solve for either one. Okay. So the Lyman series is down to one, Balmer series down to two, The passion, which I'm not going to label on our diagram, is when the n final or the principal quantum number is 3. Now we can't see the passion, it's lower energy, these are in the infrared. So lower energy than the human eye can perceive. You can buy infrared cameras to detect infrared radiation. Night cameras detect infrared. And the last one I'm going to mention, bracket, you're going to guess the pattern. We went Lyman is 1, Balmer is 2, Passion is 3, bracket is down to n equals 4. And these are also in the infrared, so we can't see them. No, all of these are just for a hydrogen atom. So if you put mercury or neon or argon, these names don't apply. Okay. And you wouldn't get the bomber series. You wouldn't get those particular colors. But those colors are very characteristic to hydrogen. You put hydrogen in a lamp, and you should see the, the red, the blue, the green, and the purple. Now you're going to see the red the darkest, because it doesn't take as much energy to get electrons to go from one up to three. So there's a higher probability electrons get to three. The higher up you go, the more energy you need and the less chance they're going to get there. So you're going to see the red the darkest, the green a little lighter, the blue even lighter, and the lab we're going to do, you may or may not even see the purple or detect that purple wavelength. The energy of the nth level, so the first, the second, the third, you can calculate it. It's negative, so each energy is defined negative as you get away uh, from the nuclei. Negative, a constant, okay. called the Rydborg constant, and the H is for hydrogen. So we have a constant specific for hydrogen. And the energy is that constant times 1 over that principal quantum number squared. So for the first energy level, it's minus the constant times 1 over 1 squared. Now what we're going to care about is we want to know transitions. Okay, what's the difference? You go 4 to 2. The change in energy is still we got to factor in that constant, the Rydberg constant, times 1 over n initial squared minus 1 over n final squared. Okay. And those n's are always whole numbers. They're quantized. You can't have an energy level of 2.5. That is not allowed according to quantum mechanics. Uh, just a little comment on signs that you might get. 
if you get a positive change in energy, this is energy that's absorbed. So it was energy put in to drive an electron up. If you get a negative number, this is energy release. This would be the down. Or absorbed is energy driving an electron up. When you end up solving for a wavelength, don't take the negative forward. Don't calculate negative wavelengths. You get a negative number for the change in energy. You realize that's energy uh, that's going to get released. It's an electron falling back down. So everything's going to build upon this slide uh, in the rest of this lesson. I'll do some math examples. Next, I want you to kind of see these colors and see these transitions on a spectrum. So don't put this in your notes. Okay? But these are some of the spectrum we would see, the colors we'd see for elements other than hydrogen. Because okay? hydrogen was the red, the green, the blue, and the purple. For mercury, mercury has tons of electrons. When I say tons, so mercury is atomic number 80, so there's 80 different electrons in mercury okay, in multiple energy levels. If you take mercury, you heat it up, and you drive those electrons up, and then they can fall back down. And some of those transitions down will be in the visible part of the spectrum. Okay? And we see these particular colors or wavelengths. Okay. Now the human eye will put all those colors together and perceive one color. But if you have a spectrometer or a prism, something that can spread out light, like a rainbow, it's just white light being spread out into all its frequencies. So you have something that can make a rainbow. You won't see all the colors in a rainbow from mercury. You're just going to see particular transitions. Lithium, you see very different lines. A couple blue, a red. Every element has characteristic colors. If you kind of go down to the bottom, sodium, you tend to see a bunch of yellow lines close together. There's a couple lines there. If you ever have a fire and you see some orangey or more particularly the yellow coming off a of fire, maybe at a beach, that is often caused by sodium uh, in the sand or in the wood. You burn it and that produces that yellow color. Okay? Calcium also produces a yellowy orange color okay? that you typically see with most campfires. Uh, these characteristic lines that we see, they're all caused by certain transitions. So maybe it's the 12th energy level down to the 4th might cause one of these lines. These transitions being unique lets us take a telescope pointed at a hot body. You can point the Hubble telescope at a distant sun. Look to see what lines do you see. And if we see these particular lines coming from a sun in a far off galaxy, we can maybe determine that there is strontium on that body. So we don't have to go to a distant galaxy to try to figure out what elements might be there. We can use these spectra to help determine what might be uh, on a distant sun. Now it has to be hot. We can't point a telescope at the moon because the moon isn't hot. The moon not being hot is not going to drive electrons up. And if there's no hot source to drive electrons up, they can't fall down and we can't see that emission coming out. Okay. So this wouldn't work uh, for our planet. Okay. So there can't be a distant galaxy looking at the Earth and looking at the emission from our Earth because we're not hot enough. Okay. But sun, stars uh, would be hot enough. And this is definitely done and one way to detect elements. Um, throughout our solar system. Again, just an example to talk about. A continuous spectrum is a rainbow. There's all the colors there. A continuous spectrum would not be made from a particular element. Elements are going to have certain distinctive lines coming out, being emitted or released. So we have a rainbow continuous at the top. The bottom, we have 
what we'd see for hydrogen. This red line is the th third energy level, electrons falling down to two. The green is electrons in four falling to two, the blue is five to two, and that light purple is the six to two. Okay. This is characteristic of hydrogen. You see those exact colors and those exact frequencies, you can detect hydrogen. So we're getting near the end. We're going to do a little bit of math with the Lyman series, which is a great lead-in for you doing the Balmer series on your own. So I'm going to determine the wavelength of a photon release or a quanta release. That was the term I used a couple lessons ago for the first three tra transitions of the Lyman series. I want to make a little summary of the first three. So I would have to, or if I asked you to do this, you'd have to realize Lyman is down to one. So the first transition would be the next closest. So two would be the closest to one, down to one. The next one, we have to be down to one. So that'd be three down to one. And then the last line, Lyman has to be down to one, so that's four down to one. I'm going to do this in two steps. I'm going to start by getting the energy, and then I'll figure out the wavelength. So you're going to get this relationship. You don't have to memorize it. So that's our constant for hydrogen. This only works for hydrogen. The Lyman series is for hydrogen. times 1 over n initial squared. So we're starting at 2. So 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over, what's the final? We're ending at 1. Bit of waste of time, but I will square 1, at least in the relationship. If you have a graphing calculator, you could just input this all in. If you have a scientific calculator, you may want to deal with the fractions one at a time. I inputted all of this, and I got negative 1.64 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So that is our energy for the transition. We got a negative number, and we just have to realize this is energy out or released. I use the word out because it's easier to write. So I'm not going to continue that negative, but these are colors we're going to see. It's not an input. It's an output. Now I asked for what wavelength would I see. I want to deal with the wavelength part. So that was kind of our introductory Planck relationship. From a couple lessons ago, energy is Planck's constant times the frequency, nu. That's not a V. For velocity, it's nu. And then I did a substitution. You can substitute for nu. I substitute C over lambda. The speed of light of an electromagnetic wave divided by lambda is the same as the frequency. 
So we just figured out the energy of the transition. It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, and that's going to be equal to HC over lambda. So I'm going to rearrange this for lambda. I'm not going to show all my work or my algebra. Lambda equals the wavelength could come up to where the red energy term is, and the red energy term uh, can go down to where lambda is. So I can solve for the wavelength. C is going to be in meters per second, and our wavelength is going to be in meters. So 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Joule seconds times the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So both of those are just from a formula sheet. You wouldn't have to memorize those. In rushing, I'd lambda twice in my relationship. So I set it right that E goes to the bottom. I just wrote lambda by mistake. Okay. So that's going to be the same for all of our transitions. We just have a different energy, 1.61 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. The minus went away. That was out. We're not going to get a negative wavelength. So I have joules on the top and joules on the bottom. In my numerator, I Seconds on the bottom and seconds on the top. So the only thing that didn't cancel out was my meters. And I got 1.21 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. So that's done. We just maybe want to use a different unit. I can use the factor label method to convert my units. Okay, there's many ways to convert them. There's many strategies. You just have to develop one that works for you and, and your brain. So I want to cancel out meters and I want to get nanometers. So every one meter is 10 to the 9 nanometers. and you end up with 121 nanometers. And that is not in the visible. The visible is 400 to 800-ish that we can see, and this is outside the visible 4 to 800. So that's the first line of the Lyman series. I'm not going to do the next two. I'd like to see if you can do the second transition and the third transition. So what is the three to two? I'll summarize that answer in a little bit and then the four to two. Oh, two. Good work. I was testing you and you passed. So that 3 to 1 again was 103 nanometers. The 4 to 1 is 97.5 nanometers to check your work. And that wraps up our 
uh, Bohr model, but just for the hydrogen atom. Next will be quantum numbers.